This is Alice, student, laptop open, finishing a few tasks before class. Across the room is Bob, same coffee, same Wi-Fi, very different plans. Alice connects to the cafe's free Wi-Fi, like everyone else here. One tap and she's online. Bob connects to the same network, he blends in, another face in a quiet afternoon. Normally, devices talk straight to the router, point A to point B. But on public Wi-Fi, a stranger can quietly sit in the middle of that path. Everything looks fine, pages load, nothing feels wrong. Some sites protect the lane with encryption, others leave parts of the lane open. When that lane is open, the trip can be watched and sometimes copied. Many sites keep people signed in with a session, a temporary pass that says, this is still Alice. If that pass travels without protection, someone else can try to use it. Most traps don't shout, they blend in. An update prompt here, a too familiar page there. A tiny change in a web address can open a very big door. No alarms, no warnings, just traffic taking a quiet detour. From Alice's seat, everything is ordinary. From Bob's seat, ordinary is an opportunity. In one minute, a stranger can learn a lot about a stranger. How does someone get between a device and the internet? Stay with this story. Next, the invisible move and how to close the door. Bob's first move isn't dramatic, it's orientation. Before anything else, he figures out where he's sitting on this network. Think of it like unfolding a street map before choosing a route. The goal is simple. Understand the local neighborhood, what lane he's in, how big the neighborhood is, and who might be nearby. We can see here that Bob knows his local IP address and the subnet of the network. So now he knows where to look for Alice's IP address. Most home and cafe networks look like this, a compact block of addresses where laptops, phones, and small devices all share the same hallway. The question now is, who else is walking this hallway with him? Next, Bob runs a discovery pass to see who's around and what they might be talking on, just a count of live devices and broad hints of the services they expose. Remote desktop, often found on Windows, usually answers on a predictable number, 3389. It's not always there, and sometimes it's moved, but if it does respond, it's like seeing a porch light switch on. For that, he uses the nmap command, a very powerful tool to scan the network and the devices connected to it. He can use the subnet found by the last command to narrow his search for Alice. One reply is enough to mark a pin. A single host on this network appears to speak remote desktop. No passwords, no access, just a note on the map that says, this door answers when called. With that pin placed, Bob knows which direction to look. It doesn't mean he can walk in, only that the door exists, and now it's on his radar. Before Bob gets too comfortable, he reaches for another tool, BetterCap. It's like swapping out a flashlight for a floodlight. Suddenly, the shadows in the hallway get sharper. With a few keystrokes, Bob can watch the network's pulse in real time, seeing who's talking and how loudly. When he runs the arp.spoof command, it's not about barging in, it's about listening from the doorway, catching the rhythm of the conversation. The map gets annotated with movement, not just static pins. Next comes a respectful inventory. Which doors seem open? And what do their doorbells sound like? A web service here, Windows plumbing there, and remote desktop among them. The point is situational awareness, not trespass. Understanding what's present without touching what's inside. Bob isn't just watching, he's tuning in. With BetterCap's HTTP.proxy, he sets up a listening post, catching snippets of web traffic as they pass by. It's like overhearing fragments of conversation through an open window, not prying, just observing the flow. Each packet is another clue, another brushstroke on the map, helping Bob understand the patterns without stepping inside. From Alice's view, nothing has changed. News, email, a student portal. From Bob's view, a sketch on the back of a napkin has become a legible map. Addresses, services, patterns. Two taps, two very different trips. One is wrapped in protection with HTTPS. The other is bare HTTP 
traveling as readable text. On a public network, that difference decides what the middle can actually understand. In the middle seat, open envelopes reveal where someone is going and what's inside. Locked envelopes still pass through, but their contents stay sealed. Over plain HTTP, the middle can see page requests, site names, and sometimes the session token that keeps someone signed in. Like seeing the address and the key in the same glance. Responses speak too. A page comes back with images and text, and occasionally a new session cookie. Another version of that temporary pass that says, this is still Alice. Passwords aren't the only prize. A working session can be enough to walk straight in without typing anything at all. If a session travels without protection, the middle can copy that badge and try to use it elsewhere, impersonating someone without ever knowing their password. With HTTPS, the middle still sees that a connection exists, but not the contents, the pages, the text, or the session token. All of it is wrapped. Readable versus wrapped. On the left, requests and cookies can be understood. On the right, the same trip becomes opaque, visible as traffic, but not as meaning. From the attacker's seat, most of the work is waiting and watching. If the lane is open, readable moments appear. If it's locked, they don't. Even without passwords, unprotected browsing can reveal what someone reads, hints about their device, and, if they're unlucky, the pass that keeps them signed in. One unsecured tab is enough to leak a pass. Another tab with protection gives nothing away. It only takes one careless lane to create an opening. Content is what someone reads. A session is who the site thinks they are. If the middle learns either on an open lane, it's already too much. Even without seeing a password, copying a session can be enough to get in. From Bob's seat in the middle, the goal shifts from watching to steering, nudging a click here, changing a road sign there, so a familiar site quietly opens a convincing copy. This is website spoofing, a page that looks right, feels right, but lives at a slightly off address, close enough to fool the eye in a hurry. Spot the tells, a domain that isn't quite right, branding that's a shade off, or a login request that arrives when nothing needed a login. One swapped letter, or a new ending on the address, can turn a safe stop into a trap door. The most effective traps borrow the familiar, same colors, same logo, same tone, until the moment credentials are handed to the wrong place. Pop-up phishing leans on panic. Your security is broken, click to fix, when the click is the problem and the fix is malware. Bogus updates don't need to break in, they ask for permission, counting on someone to agree before reading the fine print. A fake login's purpose is simple. Collect credentials now, or plant a foothold that will ask for them later. A subtle redirect, just one detour, can land on a page where everything looks normal and every keystroke goes somewhere it shouldn't. Even a small, inline prompt can harvest a password, or deliver a download that quietly changes the rules on the device. Caution is a skill. Check the address, question the urgency, and avoid typing secrets where the story doesn't require them. The script rarely changes. Urgency, authority, reward, just enough pressure to borrow trust for a few seconds. From the middle, steering beats smashing. No noise, no alarms, just a gentle push toward a waiting form. The danger isn't just spying, it's steering someone into traps. First habit, prefer sites that use a secure connection. Look for HTTPS and a clear security indicator in the address bar. It means the trip is encrypted, so eavesdroppers can't read along, even if they sit on the same Wi-Fi. Encryption doesn't judge the website's honesty, but it does wrap the contents. If the page shows not secure, assume anything typed that could be read in transit. Second habit, turn on a trusted VPN before using public Wi-Fi. A VPN creates a private tunnel, so local snoops on the cafe network only see encrypted traffic going to the VPN, not the sites or sessions inside. Set the VPN to auto-connect on untrusted networks and enable a kill switch. If the tunnel drops, the kill switch prevents traffic from leaking out unprotected. Third habit, avoid logging into banking, email recovery, or other sensitive accounts on open Wi-Fi. If it can wait, wait, save sign-ins for a known, trusted network. When a login can't wait, strong protections help. 
two-factor authentication and passkeys make stolen passwords less useful, especially on risky networks. Fourth habit, double check the exact Wi-Fi name. Lookalike hotspots are common. Confirm the name with staff and avoid networks that don't match exactly. Turn off auto-join for public networks and forget them after use. This prevents your device from reconnecting by itself where someone could imitate the hotspot. For important tasks, consider a mobile hotspot instead of public Wi-Fi. A private connection reduces the number of strangers sharing your lane. Round it out with basics. Keep software updated, leave the firewall on, disable file sharing on public networks, and limit nearby sharing to contacts only. Small habits add up. Choose encrypted pages, use a VPN, postpone sensitive logins, and verify the network name. A few habits make a big difference on public networks. If this helped, give it a like, subscribe for more clear, practical security videos, and tap the bell so the next chapter finds its way to the feed. Lock the lane, choose the route, see the internet, without letting the internet see everything.